This episode of Reasonably Spontaneous Conversations is brought to you in part by In Search of the New Compassionate Male. For more information, go to newcompassionatemail.com. Sean, what led you into the, the process of teaching? What, where, what was your journey into that? Because this is, what a time for ev- education. What a time to be even to be thinking about that. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you, Dennis. Um, so I would say what led me to really want to learn more and to be able to teach was um, my mom had a friend who was in special forces and served in Laos during the Vietnam War, and he was missing in action. And around 1990, uh, they made, um, with the Laotian government, they found his remains and returned him. And I spoke to a lot of Vietnam veterans when I went with my mom to the funeral, and I'm realizing there's all this history here. Like, like uh-huh. there's like a, a treasure trove of history. I want to learn more about it, and I feel like I want to... T- sort of put that information out there. So probably about early high school, I realized teaching is what I wanted to do. It it, it was about stories and the learned part of stories that I could give to other people and have them do their own further research into that topic. All right. So ground me, when and where were you 18 years old? This is around 1990. All right. So the internet had not started. You were where? Uh, I grew up in the south shore of Massachusetts, around okay. the the Rockland, uh, Massachusetts area. Was it was it homogenous? Was, was, was it white? Was it? What, I mean, what was the? You, you know, your general. I grew up upper middle class, upper middle class in South Texas. There was a very classist society. You know, where where the 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 Latinos and 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 the African Americans were separated uh, from us, just in in our own classes at seventy three. What was your what was your the, what was the structure there? I mean, I grew up in a, in a very middle class um, sort of. I guess you would call it homogenous. I mean, mm-hmm. I I was lucky enough to to have a wide variety of of different creeds, races, and colors in my classes. Um, How wonderful! We actually had a large um, a Cambodian and Vietnamese population in the South Shore, and so a lot of uh, my fellow students were of that ethnicity and. Um, you know, they were, you know, they've been in the States for years. So yep. they were, they are American, just like me. You know, when you, when I look back at high school and trying to fit in and trying to figure out who I was as a human being, how were you in that fit in culture, especially as you are seeing all the kids today and what they're having to do as they're having to go through this? So all right, this is an amazing question and it ties directly into the work I've been doing, which is. I always felt a little out of step. I always felt like I, I just did in, into a lot of the, the <laughs> South Shore mindset of like play sports and, and do this and be popular. Um, one of my greatest heroes in life, is, and I say this with all sincerity, is David Bowie. Someone like David oh. Bowie was able to be different and and emanate that difference and say it's okay to be different and and i i remember when bowie died um a couple of years ago how how Mm -hmm. devastated i was because i felt like it was a a teacher of mine passing away and and you know bowie was able to become pop and industrial and all these different things and i realized that it was okay to be different but also okay to to change and to and to grow and to be as amorphous as possible that is amazing. That That is an extraordinary. And so how did you relate yourself and who you were to the rest of your classmates at that at that age? You know, I mean, one of the things is, I mean, do you remember when Joss Whedon was cool? You know, I mean, he yeah, really everyone loved Joss Whedon. Absolutely. Yeah, but but that but back back then when when Joss Whedon was cool, the, the, the idea was high school was hell. 
And so being able to to adapt and to go through that in in that process of learning our own identities. Well, well, Dennis, I think it's more of finding your people. And, and it took me a long time to find my people. It really was junior year when I started getting involved in both chorus and the drama club that I found my people. And, you know, uh, I grew up at a time where like the the breakfast club idea of clicks was still very much real. I have a 15 year old daughter and she saw that movie with me and she's like, that's not how high school is at all. Or the blending of all five into each other. Whereas it was very much, you know, a weird little cast system in high school where you didn't really leave. So I was a drama kid and that yeah. gave me a little bit of, it gave me a little bit of autonomy amongst my peers. And, oh. and they knew like Sean, you know, if if they came into the theater and I was hanging lights and I told them to leave, they could have been the most popular person in the world. And they would have said, oh, sorry, no problem, I'll leave. Whereas if I was in the gym, they would yeah, have exactly. been long here and I would have had to leave. So, you know what I mean? Like, like I feel like maybe 91, 92, that might've been the last generation of having yeah. that click. Yeah, and, and I find it interesting what you said about, about the journey into teaching and your love of history, because with marrying those two things together, because we're, we're right now we're in a place where people are going nuts about, uh, about history and, and are, are, are saying, oh, my God, you can't teach history. Oh, my God, you, we, we can't look. What is this? What is this? <gasps> critical race theory and 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 my god the 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 what what, what happened it's at, at uh any of the any of the processes that got us here today but i don't see how we can know how we got here today unless we study how and the route that we got here so so with all due respect to the growing and, and very much needed stem i still feel that we will always need historians that that having having a historian and having someone who's who's looking to give pure history is is the greatest thing we can have in a society because we need people to be able to hold up the past and say all right this isn't judgy this is this is what happened let's see if we can find some corollary between then and now and you know i, I think recently with everything we've been going through with covid Yes. Um, I was lucky enough for the first book that I wrote last year was a co-creation with my um, a fellow author of mine, Linda Hickson. We yeah. wrote a book on Worcester, the city I live in during yes. the 1918 influenza pandemic. And we didn't time it to have it come out during a <laughs> pandemic. It just happened to be that we were had. Oh yeah, it just to happened to. And you know, I, I find I find I, I love your term there, Sean, because to me, uh, I have had enough synchronicity and coincidence in my life to know that there is something going on in the clockworks of the universe that I don't truly understand. Now, people can name it and try to put their frame around it. But like Richard Feynman said, God is too large for the stage. There is something there, there, there is something bigger that 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 is beyond my ability to comprehend. So therefore, something is happening. So these synchronicities, like you put it, doing this book with Linda, and what is the name of it? Oh, the, the name of the book that we did, uh, it came out in 2020 called The Grip. The uh, Grip. The Grip. G-R-I-P, yeah, like, like the grip, like the... Like the, the, the so it's flu. a play on words. The flu, the influenza of 1918 was called, was called La Grip. But we yeah. also used it as the grip, the way that the flu had its hold on cities like oh. Whisper and Boston and, and, and others across the, the world. Well, I promise you I've been safe and boosted, but if I was with you, I'd put on my mask and give you a hug because plays on words, uh, plays on words and the, the work is, is the, the absolute core of everything that, that, that we're doing there. So, so thank you. So what, what did you learn about yourself in, in, doing, in, in writing that book? Um, so it, it premiered, it actually, prepared me to write the next one, the, the Man Ray book. Yeah. Um, I learned about really hearing people's stories. Um, I, I went through a lot of uh, oral histories of, of people that survived the influenza pandemic, mm -hmm. people that lived during that time. And I, I learned, I learned, you know, to be a general, in general, a better historian, but I learned to be a better listener that, that, that I was Thank going you. to be able to find 
the 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 narrative in the stories that I'm hearing. Not not you know many historians and, and you know they're very good at what they do. Absolutely, they like to the narrative themselves. I would rather the person speak and be able to let that push the narrative. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say that because there are, there are times when I will read something like I'll read a, a, a very authoritative book on Leonardo da Vinci by one of the book, and, and, but they will talk about scenes and things that happen and went, uh, maybe, yeah. but I would prefer to hear it from, and this is one of the, the things that I so love and one of the things that I love about my career and the work that, that that I've done over the career is that I've actually gotten a chance to lay the groundwork so that historians can actually go back and hear Sean Driscoll, to hear you talk about Man Ray, you talk about your journey, you yeah. talk about it rather than someone to, someone making up what they think you were saying. Well, that's why I like like having an opportunity like this is so amazing and and hopefully throughout the next year i'll be able to have i've got another book um talk happening at the end of the month i'm hoping Wonderful. to have more where i can get people in seats and say here is this history here's the process that that i i, I craft i i use to craft it here's the stories and, and walk away from this knowing that that you know at one point in time these people lived in in a, a much different world than we did, and you get to hear that from their voice, not me telling you, you know, yes. oh, J Jane, Jane and Joe did this. <laughs> Here's Jane and Joe actually telling you what they did. That's the great. That is the great thing about oral history, and I and I yes, I'm grateful that I've learned about oral history in my in my PhD program. The and and sort of being able to run with it and take it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you say that, uh, Sean. Did you, are you, um, I, Renee, our director, uh, and, and I have, have both been uh, studying Zora Neale Hurston, and she went down and interviewed all, all of the, all, all of the, the people, and an anthropological story before she ever wrote her. So the stories that you hear from her short stories are actually the voices of the people that did this and she ends up being she was part of the harlem renaissance and part i'm really an extraordinary uh an extraordinary uh writer so anyway we'll be doing more on on her later i, I just wanted to share that's that cool. i agree with you and that's it so let's talk a little let's start a conversation here about man ray and why what was t tell me the germs of it uh, of when you before you were ready to lay down tape and do the interviews in this, what impelled you to start the project? Um, well, we have to go back as historians, we have to go back to the beginning. Um, and in a, the beginning. A, a cold winter night in 1992, where my friends from the South Shore, we all drove in and she said, my friend Christine said, you have to come to this club. It's dark, it's foreboding, it's fun, it's exciting. <laughs> they play 80s music, you're going to love it. And I was, you know, this small sort of like provincial <laughs> middle class kid. And I was you know, driving into the big bad city. I'm telling people I'm going to Central Square, Cambridge. They're like, you're going to get stabbed. And I'm like, okay, but I'm going to, I'm going to try this. So I walked into the club and it, I'm, what I'm about to tell you is really what has been echoed in all yeah. the interviews I did. It just felt like home. It felt oh. like I finally walked into a place that I, I belonged and it was full of the craziest freakiest people you can ever possibly uh, imagine for 1992 yes before freak was allowed to be this was this yeah. was this is really really an opportunity for people to to express who they are but the early stages of doing that and the, oh keep going Oh, so, so, so basically, so I, I spent 1992 till about 2005 going to this club week mm -hmm. after week after week, going with friends, making new friends, cut to 2019. I'm in my PhD program. Yes. Man has been closed since 2005. Right. And it still was here. It was still in my heart. And yes. I felt like, like as a historian, this is history that's untapped. It's uncharted. No one has ever chronicled what this club was or what it meant to thousands and thousands and thousands of people over the years. Mm -hmm. So 
before I dove into my dissertation studies, which have absolutely nothing to do with Man Ray, um, I went to two people, Chris Ewan and Terry Nidzwicki. Chris was the longtime DJ at Man Ray and Terry was mm -hmm. a longtime bartender. And I wanted to get their approval first and say, this is what I'm doing. You know, would it be something you'd want to be involved in? I knew right away that I wasn't going to be writing a, a general monograph, that I really wanted to use oral history to tell the story, both chronologically and thematically. And then they were involved and then they gave me the names of people. And then during the summer of, of COVID around 2020, I started doing interviews. And in the end, I interviewed over 120 people and got about oh. 140 interviews from DJs, bartenders, oh. dancers, attendees, people in the music scene, um, people in the, the radio scene in Boston, wow. and really had about two hours per person and just asked them questions of, you know, ranging from how Man Ray fit into their lives, did they take anything away from their time at Man Ray, clothing, dancing, you know, after oh. going afterwards, I really ran the gamut of trying to get their story about yeah. Man Ray. And every single person, Dennis, from, 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 from A to Z said the same two things. They said, it's home and yes. it's a safe place. Not two things you would normally oh. ascribe to, to, a, to a nightclub. A nightclub is a fun, but absolutely very atmospherically dark place. Not something you go to every week. Maybe you go once every couple of months. Absolutely. Once a year. Man Ray was a place that you went every single week. You met your people wow. every week. And Unfair. all right, so here you are with, let's say, 240 hours of interviews. Now, you as a writer, historian, need to weave this together as a narrative and begin to piece it together. Tell me about that. So it all starts with having great collaborators. Yes. And I knew right away there was no way I could do this on my own. I needed other people and other voices to help me. So I, I grabbed three people who literally, I cannot stress enough how instrumental they are in crafting this book. Tell us. Sam, Samantha Levitre, who is mm -hmm. a classmate of mine in my master's program. Uh, a friend of mine, Ted Rassicott, who entered my master's program after I graduated. And his girlfriend, a journalist named um, uh, Mina Corpus. Oh. Together... We took these interviews, I conducted the interviews, and then we all grabbed a batch of interviews and did our own transcription, our own editing. And then we oh. all got together and said, all right, how do we craft a chapter? How do we create this thematically? You know, there are all these different dance nights, all these different topics, all these different, and really most importantly, all these different cultures. Yes. LGBTQ, punk, new wave, BDSM, um, all these different groups that we had to figure out where they fit both chronologically and thematically. So I can't say enough about the collaborative effort oh. I had with my editors. It, I, 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 I'm so glad to hear you say that, Sean, because uh, it is such a collaborative art. Anything, when we talk about the lone writer sitting in, the, in his basement being all, all by himself in this, I don't see that today anymore because this just like the, the, the times have changed. We are, we are exploring levels of communication, levels of complexity in human consciousness deeper than we've ever explored before. It's like we were skimming a surface and now we're going much deeper. And the only way I can possibly do this is by doing this as a team, is being able to do this. And, and, and that art of collaboration is such an extraordinary process. Well, well, I'm glad you said that, Dennis, because I it's one of the things I try to relate to my students where I say, look, if you think that Albert Einstein just sat in a room and did it all himself, you're wrong. <laughs> he actually had collab people who he collaborated with. If you all think the time. Niels Bohr and he would go on long walks. They would sit there. They, they would do these perambulating meetings that they, yep. and they would discuss back and forth. It was a 
supremely anybody who understands quantum not understands but knows some of the history of quantum quantum physics and the entire movement from newtonian to quantum knows that the collaborative was the process yeah yeah i mean i mean maybe i would say Maybe J.D. Salinger would be the only person I could think of. To say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe he's a little bit reclusive, but but someone like Jack Kerouac had Gregory Corso and William Burroughs. You know, someone like Nora Zeal Hurston had Langston Hughes and others. Thank you. They had they had people around them that fed their energy and fed their 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 op, you know, their options and ambitions. And I I knew that when writing this book. I couldn't just sit in a room and do it myself. I needed others. And here's, I want to just sort of dovetail this. These three people who I brought on as editors had never gone to Man Ray. They had never stepped foot in this club. And now that each of them had said to me, I feel like I know more about Man Ray than I've ever wanted to know about anything oh. in my life. And I said, that's a good thing because that means that you're able to give that history to others who haven't been. Yes. And that's one of the great things is that I want this book to reach people who are going out dancing and going yes. to clubs and saying, wow, there was this long before I was going out, there was this. And it's something that they can hold on to and bring with them as they're crafting who they are as wow. someone that goes out and, 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 you know, lives their best nightlife. Because I haven't uh, read the book, and I'm, nightlife has not been uh, other than television. Because I, I am a, I love television, and so that has been my nightlife. But anyway, but in the night, in in since I have not read uh, Man Ray yet, I, I want to know the. Did you contextualize it within the historical of where the culture was at the time from '95 to 2005, so that people could people would get a sense of hey. This was not something that every that you know that that this this was really like crossing the Rubicon and going having having a, a, an opportunity to have this safe space. So so when I was trying to figure out how what I wanted to title this book, um, there is a song by um, a group called Icicle Works called um, Birds Fly, but it's also known as Whisper to a Scream, and one of the lines in the song is. We are, we are, we are, but your children. Oh. Finding our way around indecision. And one of the things I realized oh. is that we are all children of this club. Anyone who went to this club, worked at it, yeah. we spent, whether we were 40 when we went there or 19 when I started, we all spent a, a version of adolescence at this club. And, yes. and before... Man Ray was Man Ray, it was a, a gay nightclub called Campus in 83. And then in 85, Bruce Job, who was a manager of uh, Campus, went to the owner of Campus, Don Holland, and said, I have an idea for a second nightclub within the building. And he based it off of what he called the art of nightlife. And he named it Man Ray after the Dada artist Man Ray. Mm -hmm. And get, sort of brought this idea that you can blend art and nightlife together that you can blend music and visuals. And um, the club started in 85 as a second part of campus. And then in later in 85, it just became Man Ray and it stayed Man Ray for 20 years. Now we all know, let's take the most famous club in the world, Studio yes. 54. Studio 54 lasted in its heyday for all of about, you know, a year and a half to two years. Yes and had to rebrand and had to change. Exactly. Man Ray never really had to change or rebrand. It stayed what it was. It brought in new people, new adventures, new art. Um, there were new nights that were formed, but they had a certain sort of set of nights that brought people in year after year after year. <sighs> and, and this is uh, I, what I love about what you're doing. All right. So you, you, you finished this book, you, the problem, Sean, is is that, that I have too many questions. No, no. I mean, I understand. I you have to understand as because I'm also a writer, and because I've also written a book, uh, and I've done and I've done a, a number of long form. I, I realize that there are there are a million places where we could enter this conversation and be and have it to be something that is salient. I need you to guide me. 
Sure. Tell me what we are not talking about that would be important for us to, to make sure that we want to have that on this particular time when you and I are having a reasonably spontaneous conversation. Um, I would say what we're not talking about, and it's a touchy subject considering how much we have to sort of live in this new world of, of COVID and, and distance yep. is, and I'm speaking strictly as an extrovert. Please. I'm sure you've, I'm sure in your uh, life. Another one, you and I are both, we, we, we're, we, I, we actually got a chance to experience what the introverts say uh, in, in having to go in the COVID times. It's, it's and like, yeah. Oh. And what we're not talking about is that ability when it's when it's when people are ready to to go back out and have connectivity yeah. we don't we, we we're not talking about it because it's such a foreign topic even at this point where yeah. where you know all you're being told is you know you have to separate you have to be you know you know separate from everyone and that's and that's fine that's for your health but there's going to come a point and this is the historian's yes. mind speaking where we have to, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like looking historically, you have the 1918, 1919 pandemic yeah. on the heels of that. You have the 20, the twentieth, the twenties, you have a, a bustling nightlife. We're oh. going to have that. I'm, I'm making a prediction. Roaring. Maybe I'm wrong. We are going to have that, whether it's a year from now or two years from now. Yep. A book like we are, but your children hopefully lets people know that it's okay to create nightlife that it's okay yeah. to make connectivity it's okay to find your people it's okay to be on a dance floor it's okay to to have that drink in your hand if that's what you so wish it's okay to really explore who you are mm -hmm. and and that's where i feel like in sort of bringing this all back to bowie that's what david bowie did he made it available for people to have connectivity people who normally and, and I've, I've used this term in the book and I've, I've used it in life. People who have a quote, shared weirdness. The, I'm sorry, not everyone yep. has, you know, everything together. People are all in different parts of their lives. People don't feel like they connect. I call it shared weirdness. And I love that connectivity oh. with someone. I know that, I that, that I've reached the spirit. You know, one of the things that, that I have found uh, having done interviews over and conversations over the course of my life is that I believe that we are each identically unique. So the fact that, that, that someone is bringing their weirdness is merely they're just bringing their unique humanity, their individuality of who they are into the process. And the more I dig into it with people, uh, as, uh, especially people who, who have the trappings of success, the more I see that they are just as scared, as weird, as, as broken, as challenged, as wondering as everybody else. I just don't meet anyone who isn't. And so the, the fact of you helping us get there, helping us to see that each of us is, is weird. Each of us has our own piece of this pie that we bring, that this expression that no one else no, has never existed, will never exist again in its own entity. So God, for God's sake, let's be ourselves. Exactly. 100%. Sean, thank you so much for this opportunity to have a reasonably spontaneous conversation. I, I feel, I feel very, I feel a great deal of camaraderie with you and a great deal of, uh, of uh, collaboration. I would love to be able to continue as you uh, both write and figure out other things that you're going to be doing and the expression and your teaching and your history. Uh, if you would continue to please connect with Renee and me and, and let, us, let us be part of this conversation because the conversation that you're having and what you're doing is the conversation we want to have thank you dennis i really appreciate the opportunity uh to have this conversation with you and it has been i i i literally say i i think you know this is great collaboration is great conversations are great and i and applaud you for doing this and doing it so well thank you very much my pleasure sean thank you everybody and thanks for coming by for sean and 
in my uh, recently spontaneous conversation. We'll see everyone next time. This episode of Reasonably Spontaneous Conversations has been brought to you in part by In Search of the New Compassionate Male. For more information, go to newcompassionatemale.com.